Today I'm going to be talking about paperwork and more specifically for Canadians. But don't run away because if you're operating a UAV commercially in Canada, you're going to find this interesting. This new exemption from Transport Canada that took effect last week came with this flowchart and also a list of different criteria for two categories of UAVs, less than two kilograms and between two and 25 kilograms. The flowchart and the list, they're kind of nice, but they kind of oversimplify things. Uh, you might be left with some questions, I surely was. Uh, and so I found the actual exemption and uh, it's um, not easy to find on the Transport Canada website. You kind of have to know where to click. I'm gonna put a link in the description. If you follow all of these rules, uh, you should be allowed to operate a UAV commercially without needing to obtain an SFOC. So that's gonna make the paperwork a lot easier. Actually, it's gonna eliminate most of the paperwork. Otherwise, you'll still need to obtain an SFOC. So that's important to remember, even if you can't uh, or you need to operate outside of these boundaries, you can still do that. You just need to obtain an SFOC. I won't go through all of the list because most of the items in here are easy to understand. Like for instance, you need to be 18 years old or at least 16 years old if you're conducting research under academic supervision. Uh, you also need to fly no higher than 90 meters. And many of these items are pretty obvious for anybody who's flown a UAV commercially, like for instance, never fly over a crowd, ask permission before you fly over somebody's property and respect the law in general. That means stuff like privacy law, for instance. All flights need to be conducted within line of sight. Again, it's not listed in here, but you're not allowed to do first person view FPV. Something again, that's clearly explained in the actual exemption. Uh, and you need to fly during daylight or in good weather when there are no clouds. So I'm guessing probably they mean clouds like these, not clouds like those, because that would be stupid. I just love the one at the bottom here. Do not carry dangerous goods or lasers. So does that mean that you can't carry lasers, period, or just the dangerous ones? I never thought of putting a laser on my UAV, but now that I mention it, it sounds pretty cool, but apparently I'm not allowed to do that. So that's unfortunate. Things really start getting interesting when you start looking at what's not said on the list. And it's the very first item here. Be safe. Okay, fine, yes. Well trained and know the rules of the sky. So what does it mean to be well trained? Well, if you ask Transport Canada, they're going to point you to guidance material that outlines the knowledge requirements for UAV pilots. But if you read through the list, you're going to find it's kind of overkill. Like, according to this list, you'd need to be able to describe the process required to legally use LIDAR, that's light detection and ranging on a small UAV, or you need to be able to interpret air charts or calculate the height of clouds if we gave you just the dew point and temperature. So, like, most of you will think, well, what does that have to do with my small DJI Phantom? Pretty much nothing, but don't panic. This is useful knowledge, but really you don't need to know all of this in order to operate, especially a small UAV. So I went back to Transport Canada, asked them again, and this is the answer that they gave me. They said, you have to be competent and proficient to operate your specific UAV system. This training could be provided by other pilots, manufacturers, so that means like online training videos, I guess, or it could be self-taught. So don't worry, you don't have to take a mandatory class. You don't need a specific diploma. There are schools that offer training if you feel you want to go that route. But if you've been using a, uh, a UAV or a drone or a model aircraft for years as a hobbyist and you feel that you're knowledgeable and competent, uh, that is good enough for Transport Canada, it seems. Nonetheless, I do recommend that you have a look at the guidance material from Transport Canada. I'm going to put a link in the description. Even though it's overkill, I mean, it's always a good reference document, so have a look at it. And if you just start started out with a quad or multi-rotor, there's a lot that you need to know and uh, you might not realize it, so really read up on it, look at the Transport Canada website, it's a good place to start. At some point I am going to make a video, if I do, it's got, there's going to be a link up here to all of the basic knowledge that you need to have in order to operate a multi-rotor safely. It says here that you need to have an emergency plan. So. Um, I mean, mine is just dial 911, but it is a good idea to plan ahead, make sure that you know what can go wrong and how to react to it. But usually dialing 911 is probably gonna be high up on that list. Do not fly closer than nine kilometers from forest fires, airports, that makes sense. Built up areas. What's a built up area? Well, it's a kind of a 
Comme qu'ils disent eux autres. In its Canadian Aviation Regulation, Transport Canada says that it's an undefined term. So that means that it can mean different things depending on the situation and the kind, kind of aircraft you're operating. But Transport Canada has already openly said that they would not allow UAVs in big cities like Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver. But we don't know what it means for smaller cities. So you'll probably have to ask them uh, on a case by case depending on your location. It says here that you need to carry a copy of your UAV exemption. So what does that mean? What is this UAV exemption? It's the actual document that I mentioned earlier and that they can, you can print it out from the Transport Canada website. I'm going to put a link in the description. It's maybe not obvious to find at first glance on the website. You need to know where to click and uh, it's not clear what they mean in, when they say a UAV exemption. Well, it's not something you need to ask for. It's ba basically what it means that you just need to print out the new rules and carry it around with you. Don't read this. This is incomplete. Read this instead. But what it says is you actually have to have your copy with you when you fly. Operate only one UAV at a time with a single remote control. Now this one is interesting. You know when I told you don't read this, read the other one, that's because they actually oversimplified it. It's a lot clearer in this one. The reason this it can be confusing is because it says with a single remote control, but sometimes you'll want to have a second operator with his own remote control operating the payload. Like for instance, you'd have a pilot with a remote control piloting the UAV and then you'd have a second operator with a second remote control completely autonomous but he would be manning for instance the, the camera operating the camera independently and when you read this it reads one remote control you're like well am I allowed to do that yes you are I've checked with Transport Canada and you can have that does not include the payload you can have a payload operator and what it really means is the pilot can only operate one UAV at a time with one remote control but it doesn't include the payload so you can have a payload operator on a second remote control and there's no problem there you're still valid under the exemption so then i asked myself what about this this is a data link system from a well-known company and what it allows you to do is uh, control your uav from a laptop computer or even an ipad and you can establish a flight path with waypoints and the uav will follow this flight path using its gps so what I wanted to know, is this considered a valid remote control or, or is it allowed under the exemption? I've asked Transport Canada, but they remain vague. They came back with the same answer. They said the pilot needs to operate one UAV from one control station. But my interpretation is that this is okay. In my opinion, it would be allowed as long as it's the only device that you're using to control your UAV. If you don't agree with this interpretation, leave a comment below. So those are the general guidelines for UAVs less than two kilograms, like your run-of-the-mill DJI Phantom, uh, the Iris Plus from 3D Robotics would also qualify, or any obby quad like a F450. But uh, beware, if you pimp your F450 with heavy lift motors and a big battery, you'll go over the limit for sure. Remember, we're talking about the takeoff weight, so that includes the payload. If you have a small camera like a GoPro with maybe a gimbal, that's give or take about 400 grams. That leaves you about one and a half kilograms for your actual craft. That's not very much. Otherwise, you fall into the second category of UAVs between two and 25 kilograms. The same rules mentioned before still apply. And the reason you're watching this video is because they don't tell you in here that you need to send this advisory to Transport Canada 10 days prior to the flight. The good news is you don't need to wait for Transport Canada to reply back. You don't need an actual permission as long as you do your due diligence. So what you need to do is write down your contact information, your UAV model, a description of the operation you're conducting and the geographical boundaries of that operation. You put all of that in an email and you send it to this address, which you will also find in the description below. If you have any kind of accident, you also need to report it to Transport Canada in the same way. You also need to have a fire extinguisher on site, so that's easy. Ensure the UAV doesn't have an emergency locator transmitter. I don't think that applies to a lot of people, uh, but you can't have one on a UAV between 2 and 25 kilograms. It, there's no mention of it on a UAV less than 2 kilograms. Does that, does that mean that it's allowed? I don't know. I don't think this is something we really need to worry about, but um, if you disagree, then leave a comment below and I'll ask Transport Canada. For UAVs less than two kilograms, you need to keep a distance of at least 30 meters between your craft and uh, people, buildings that are not involved in the operation. For UAVs more than two kilograms, that distance is increased to 150 meters. 
So that can make a big difference in the choice of what kind of craft you want to use. So why favor one class of UAV more than the other? Less than two kilograms are going to be more flexible. Like for instance, drone journalism, something that you can just pick up, go and fly and record or gather data uh, really just immediately. That's going to be a big advantage. The heavier ones are going to be able to carry a bigger payload, obviously. So that may be interesting for the movie industry. But remember that this lifting capacity comes at a cost. You need to plan your flight 10 days in advance so that you have time to send this advisory to Transport Canada. Also, the distance that you need to keep between your UAV and people and uh, buildings that are not involved in the operation is far greater, 150 meters. That's why I think people like me who do aerial video are gonna wanna have two multi-rotors, uh, one for each weight class. But now keep in mind that you need a $100,000 liability insurance, the same that you had for your SFOC request. But now you have two UAVs, do you need to pay twice as much for your insurance? Well, good news, you won't have to because I've asked an insurance company and they told me that as long as it's a single pilot operating either one or the other craft, then your premium shouldn't go up. So that's pretty much it. That's the list uh, of things you need to know in order to operate a drone, a UAV in Canada commercially uh, without having to ask for an SFOC. That being said, it's for really low end activities. Anything that's high end, anything that needs to go like fly higher than 90 meters or out of line of sight, then you'll still have to ask for an SFOC, but it, the option is still there. Uh, it, you're gonna have to make do with the long wait time. That can be over a month but for any uh, small scale operation uh, like aerial video this is going to be very useful going to make things a lot easier if i've overlooked anything major let me know in the comments below and also tell me how you feel about these new rules and as always safe flying